Tom here from Lauren Systems, and we're going to talk about Ninja One RMM tool. A couple qualifiers I want to get out of the way. This video is not for everybody. This is a video about the tooling we use in the IT services and managed service provider industry, specifically the Ninja One RMM tool. Formerly, I was using a tool referred to as Enable right now, which used to be SolarWinds, which used to be actually GFI, and before that it was Hound Dog, and we'd been using it for about the last eight years. Full disclosure, I was on their partner committee, but my overall feelings about the company is they make a nice product, but it wasn't for us anymore. We like the features better over at Ninja One, which is why we migrated everything over there. Now, this video is also not going to be an exhaustive list of the constant debate of which is the best RMM tool, because I guarantee there's going to be someone in the comments down below that hates this product, likes another product. And if you head over to any of the community forums, such as Reddit r slash MSP, there's that debate probably going on right now as we speak with a group of people who are telling you that their RMM is terrible and that they are going to switch to another one because the grass is always greener. I don't have time for an exhaustive list of all RMM tools, but I will leave you a link to this comparison spreadsheet that I don't maintain and I'm not even positive when the last time it was updated, but it does have, well, Ninja RMM in the list along with Synchro, Enable, Navarisk, Landsweeper, Kaseya, Kabudu, Continuum, Atira, Dano, and probably a few others I may have just skipped over scrolling through this. The reality is I just don't have the time myself, and maybe if someone wants to throw a massive amount of money at me, I could actually do this. I would like to test every single RMM tool and onboard at least, and this is how we tested when we switched in November of 2021, we onboarded just 200 of our fleet, as I refer to it, the computers that we manage on there to see how it worked. And then you have to survive a couple patch management cycles from Microsoft and see how the system and platform handled it, whether or not there was any problems. You really have to do some testing. And after November and into December, on January 1st, we just migrated the rest of our fleet over to Ninja and everything went really smooth. This is the problem though, when it comes to testing of what about one of these other tools is, well, you have to kind of use it for a little while and get used to using it to really determine whether or not you're going to like it or whether or not it's a good product and hence why it's really difficult to try and pick an RMM tool and why people kind of rely on community engagement and discussions about it. But ultimately you'll find a lot of these major RMM players out there such as SolarWinds, well, which is Enable now, and ConnectWise and Kaseya and Datto and Ninja, the one I chose, have a really similar feature set out there. And I'm positive I missed one and it's probably the one someone's going to comment down below is their favorite. Anyways, the final little disclosure is going to be that this video was not provided in advance to the folks at Ninja One. This is completely my own video. My opinions are my own. This is not endorsed by or anything by Ninja One. They did not have any prior knowledge other than I told them I was going to make a video and that's as much prior knowledge as they have. I always maintain a really strong content ethics policy that I have linked over on my channel. And of course, you can find it on our website where we don't do paid reviews for things. It's just the way I work. Anyways, I want to get those out of the way. And now, just like when I do these reviews for myself, not just for the video, I actually always start with where is the security? This is a thing I throw back at people whenever they ask me about some random project that looks like it'd be cool to go deploy it somewhere. And if it's public facing or accessible where it could be a tool used against you, you really have to consider the security implications of it. And that was brought front and center in July of 2021. Kaseya became, well, a rather popular search term because of the ransomware incident. Kaseya, despite any claims they had for security, had a fail open, which would not have passed any real code audit. The fail open Open is essentially a way that someone was able to get in their systems and specifically attack the users of Kaseya and the IT companies and then deploy ransomware at scale across quite a few different companies. This was then addressed by companies like Ninja and many others, not to gloat to say our product didn't get hit in years, but this is a good write-up and a nice piece that says, here's how we're handling security. Because it took that type of incident to get many different people asking where's security. It's a question I've asked for a long time and I'm driven nuts by people who start thinking about security and start with what's the cheapest product or what's the best free way to do this, et cetera, et cetera, and never really considering the security implications of what they're doing. And that is what gets us into some of these bad situations with 
public facing things, et cetera. And I'm not going to go on a rant about that. What I do want you to read, and I'll leave a link to this, is this goes through all the process and procedures and pen testing and certifications that they go through at Ninja. I'm actually engaging directly with Ninja. And I said, this should be more than just this little page here. I've suggested they have a whole expanded, and I've said this to many vendors, page on all the details of their security, because we really should be able to see as much as possible uh, with what everything is going on and everything that's being done. I've used Bitwarden before as an example, as a company that really lays it out there because they have all the reports publicly available. That's one of the reasons I like the tool is they don't try to hide anything they're doing and they're very public facing in how they do all their pen testing. All right, now let's actually dive into the product. Now this is their getting started dashboard. You can hide this from your dashboard if you don't want it to show each time. Normally you'd probably just jump right in organizations. But I thought I'd start here to point out that if you're new to Ninja, they have a lot of documentation here. They have a lot of documentation on the core features. They have a lot of good documentation, news, community support. This is a really hard thing to test with companies. So far in January of 2022, our support experience has been great. But over the years of having some of the other products, it's back and forth. Sometimes they do great on support. Sometimes something clearly happened internal that, well, support wasn't as great or product rollouts. This is a real fuzzy thing to test, but I can at least tell you right now, we have been receiving good support. And I've heard from people that have used Ninja for longer than me that they have improved a lot because the support was okay before or they had some issues honestly i am so happy that they just have a lot of documentation that also includes things like video tutorials this makes me really happy and yes not just a little bit of write-up here you can see that these are nice extensive lots of screenshots and easy to find easy to search easy to navigate this matters a lot because i'm the person that does take the time to rtfm i don't just tell other people to rtfm or suggest it i, I always do as polite as possible but i actually take the time to really read through documentation to make sure i understand things or even if i find a flaw in a documentation that works different than expected I will then reach out to the company because this is how we get to a better solution is letting them know if you find a flaw. So far, haven't found a flaw in their documentation. So good on them for keeping this up to date. And yes, they do call it the Ninja Dojo. They do have submit a request right here to make it easy to get to uh, contacting them. Now, one of the next things to talk about is creating, adding and all this. I can't really dive deep into this for this particular video, but I can assure you it's relatively easy to do. Second, we don't have a PSA integration. So as you see, it's a little uh, blocked out here. They do support different PSAs. We do things a little different here. And at present in January 2022, we don't have a whole PSA solution we're running that attaches to it. But go ahead and check their documentation. They have quite a few of them that are supported. All the most popular ones, I would say. Now, one of the things we use Ninja for isn't just managing all these computers, but sometimes there are co-managed environments where we have them co-mingled as in we are the outside IT company helping an internal IT team maintain patches and security. And this is actually one of the features I do like about Ninja. So I created this extra user called LTS demo that's limited in scope. So we can only see the organizations I have assigned to it. They have nice permission sets on here. And I am told by quarter two of 2022, or maybe in late Q1, there's going to be more features and give you even more granular control. But this is a really important feature. If you're someone looking at a co-managed solution where you want to be able to see all of everything globally, but then offer an internal IT user a more local view of only their systems and be able to limit things in scope. This is um, the feature I'm actually using right now to have this demo user set up. So we have all of our organizations and all of our businesses in here with our entire fleet of systems that we manage, but I've narrowed it in scope to these couple ones called LTS demo office. And as you can see, it says 80% healthy four or five devices. That is actually because my staff uh, purposely kind of broke one of the systems for an unrelated test to this video. So one of the systems is just not reporting. So it says it's unhealthy. But let's talk about what is reporting and the things I set up for this particular demo. Now to make things a little bit more visible, I'm going to zoom in, but I don't want anyone to mistakenly think that everything's this big all the time. So right here's our demo office and we have the healthy systems, the problem system so it lets you quickly narrow down and focus on what's important which is usually you know figuring out why these systems are unhealthy i know why this one is so it doesn't really matter to me we can look at the os patches maintenance and we're all doing this for the lts demo office fleet so everything that would be underneath this all the different computers and systems under here we'd be able to see 
and we can say like what's installed here for OS patches. And then it's telling me how many computers have these OS patches installed. Like this one right here has it installed on two devices. We can click and we can pivot to see both of these have this installed. This one's not connected. Uh, well, not functioning properly. That's why there's some errors on it, but this is the one we're going to focus on right here. And then we can look and say, all right, this one's nice, healthy, patched and up to date. Now, the other things we can monitor inside of here, go back to LTS demo office, are all the activities. And this is the activities for everything that's in here. And this is an important for a compliance reason where you need to understand what each person was doing. We need an activity log for who logged in when. We need a log of who touched what inside of the system. So LTS demo has been busy touching things and other things are just happening like the Windows patching that is on an automated schedule. So the automated tasks don't have a user associated with them, which means they were initiated and scanned and run by the Ninja platform. And the other ones that have a user, well, there's the users on there, patch man applied, patch manager started. And we can go through this entire history. We can filter for a specific date, uh, different types, whether it's a configuration change, device, active directory, bit defender, different conditions, connect wise control. So you can filter for any time this was asked, or let's say, let's look at hardware changes. What hardware changed on here? And it just is really nice to be able to drill down very quickly across all the systems in there, because sometimes for investigative reasons, you really need to understand everything that led up to the events you're dealing with right now. And they make that relatively easy to do. Documentation. We haven't taken extensive advantage of this yet, but this allows you to build documentation and edit it. So, you know, like this particular system has an AD level 2019 uh, DCP server. We don't have any values filled in, but you can fill in each one of these and what your settings are for a backup type, email type. If it's an Office 365, is it internet WAN, virtualization, voice PBX, wireless settings that you want to have in there for that. So you know that what the SSIDs are for that. This is all just garbage and demo information we threw in here, just testing real quick. But I like the fact that you can put some of this in there. So when you're looking at it from a company standpoint, I have right on the side here, the general things I may need to know about that company. We actually keep an external documentation server. So we have this referenced in our wiki for more details on how a customer set up. But I like that there's a level of integration to it right here as well. Now, the navigation I want to mention, because as we go through this, one thing that's important to point out, all the different URLs up here. So if I wanted to click on something and we open this one here, but let's go ahead and open test wins, but just holding the control key. Hey, look, we can open up a new window and we can see things differently in each window. We can go here, go back over to the LTS demo office, but then have this one here. And maybe we want to drill down into the software inventory. And then I want to take this URL and say, copy and then send it to someone like a coworker to say, hey, can you look at the software inventory on this particular computer? From a navigation standpoint, this is something I really like the way Ninja handles this by having the absolute URL references at the top for whatever page you're on, right down to if I was in the task manager or system or files for this particular system, being able to say, hey, look at the file on here. Look at the, um, let's go into the boot file directory here. Now it doesn't put that up there, but it gets you the idea that I can at least start someone right at those pages and say, let's look at this together because that's a lot of what goes on sometimes when you're managing systems is you need some help. Your level one tech started going, I see where there's a kind of a problem, but I'm not sure how to resolve it. And they can then just send you the page. You're right on the same page. It's really a bigger convenience than people may realize having everything navigate like that. Back over here to the demo office, actually closing these extra windows that are open. Now let's actually talk about what it can do on a per machine basis. Now it supports and has a Linux client, something we're not offering at this moment here in January of 2022 is Linux management through our RMM tool. It's something we're looking at, but not exactly offering it. I usually don't manage Linux servers through here, but I wanted to load this up as a test so I could understand what was going on. There are less features here on how this functions in Linux. It just doesn't have as many features as you do in Windows, but at least it you know, can give you an idea if you notice that the software inventory is going to be just some of the Linux related things in here and not a lot of detail. Uh, I don't, yeah, there's no uninstall option for any of the software. So it works. It's not something I dove deep into. They also have a Mac client that I haven't tested at all because we don't do any Mac support. Just been one of our things. No one here uh, uses Mac. So we kind of stay away from it because it's not one of our uh, software competencies, I guess you could say. But 
Nonetheless, we will be testing in the future for Linux, and maybe I'll do an updated video and see how that works. I do love the fact, though, for Linux servers, it does have nice user account management and logging. Like, I did log in as user LTS on this system, and it does have that information on here so i can dive into what i what happened when someone logged in access was granted because it does offer maintenance reboot and terminal terminal as root i i think it's nice that they offered the ability to do some of the back end on here like i said we don't use it extensively the next thing is the nms monitoring through snmp this is a feature a few people told me that it didn't exist in ninja which really confuses me because it's in their main documentation page public facing so you can see that they have this this is a ability to load the nms tool on a server or workstation your choice when running windows of course it doesn't have a linux client and this allows you to talk to devices on that local network via snmp obviously there's limited amounts when you're doing things over snmp it's not going to be as feature rich as running an agent but for some tools like a synology that we have right here i can still get some details i can see if it's up and running i can see what data we can pull via snmp and pull it in here such as some of the disk space information this allows me to have some insight into those devices monitor them keep an eye on what's active uh, there's a lot less than the activity Activities here. They have some custom field options I haven't really played with, but it's got that feature and it's maybe something I look into a little bit more in the future, but at least it is able to pull that data and it then tells you where that NMS agent was loaded and it was specifically loaded on this Windows domain server. And this is the policy that we have set up on there. So once again, it allows you to easily pivot and set up policies around there. But there are, of course, just limitations to what you can pull from SNMP. Now the real management comes in and Specifically, we'll cover everything it can do with a Windows machine. Now, you have the option with a Windows machine of whether or not you want it to have a WSUS software patching uh, for Windows updates or you want Ninja Platform to handle the patching. We've chose to have nin Ninja Platform to handle the patching on this particular system, and it's worked quite well. This is the hardest thing to test is whether or not the software patching, and it's a constant topic of discussion because patching Windows and, well, my, even Microsoft has a hard time patching Windows, especially here in January 2022, when they rolled out patches, broke a lot of things, and pulled them off. And this is, yeah, just the aggravation you deal with working as an IT person. But let's run down everything else that it can do, such as having the serial number right here and being able to copy it to the clipboard or click on it and take us over to the Dell. I wish you could paste it in, but we can copy, paste, and see that, yep, this is an old Dell Optiplex that we have in our lab. There's the express code, the service tag, that information is right there available. We have the product key available. If it's on a domain or a work group, this one's a work group, it's not tied to a domain. Uh, TPM status, so there's not, there's an old computer, that's why it's in our lab. Public IP address. This is actually set up on a VPN, so this public IP address showing is not mine, but here is the internal IP address. So we have a lot of information on here. We have some of the recent activities. We can add notes to this particular system. This is a demo lab machine. I can edit uh, this note as needed or just hit remove and create a new note. You know, hi, YouTube. Whoop, hi, YouTube. Now we have another note. The organization to belong to. LTS demo office location because for each company you have set up, you can then set up sub locations, which some of our clients are spread out. And so we have to build all their different locations. So we know where these computers are. All that information is there. And it's also really handy when someone says, I can't get online. You can look at the computer, click on the location. And if everything's offline for that location, well, probably that whole location is offline. And let's start there at the troubleshooting process. You have the agent version, who's doing the OS patch management. It would this mode will let Ninja take full control of the Windows patch management. That's what we've done. So we'll show how that works. Latest patch scan, latest OS patch install. I told to run a scan today at 8.57 a.m. I actually ran it and installed a few things yesterday as I had this computer um, off for a little bit. So it needed those uh, wonderful Patch Tuesday patches rolled out. Diving into the details here. This is actually querying in real time the processor usage. So we can see the processor usage. Things are running. Scroll down, open ports, Windows services, user log, event log. You can start drilling down further kind of as needed in there, how many occurrences there were, last occurrence, first occurrence, those little troubleshooting things that you need when you're going through here. It's not necessarily the deep dive, but you know enough that you see what's going on. The Microsoft Defender antivirus, it's up to date, but the product is off because it would conflict with Sentinel-1 agent, which is up to date and turned on. It doesn't have any deep 
integration with Sentinel One, which is our platform of choice for managing the endpoints, but at least it lets us know it's there. We manage everything else through the Sentinel One dashboard uh, for any more details. Back over to the settings, you can see the Windows desktop, the device role, and there are a series of device roles, whether it's server or desktop, because this will control all the policies you apply to it. So it has an entire management platform that it way extensive and out of scope of this video to go through, but it allows us to create different policies that we can apply to different systems and different rules. Maybe when you want them to update or when you need them to reboot. And uh, this gives you that nice granular control, and then you can see what policy, if you want to change the policy is assigned to this device, or make an override policy, so you can apply a policy to the systems, to a group, to a location, and then maybe one particular system has some exceptions that you want it to have an override policy. And this is really nice granular control they offer on all these things. Software. We have an inventory of all the software that's in here. And we can search this. So what version of Chrome is this computer running? I, I need to know that right now. So it's a filter. Oh, there we go. It queried it. I have Chrome 9704469.2.71. What if we unremove it? I can click this and hit uninstall. There's a lot of these options in here, but of note, just because the uninstall button's there, if something doesn't have a proper silent uninstall that won't disrupt the user, it may fail the uninstall and it will let you know the status of that, whether it was a failed uninstall or it did actually properly uninstall. Like, can we remove Zoom? Let's try. Let's go ahead and hit uninstall Zoom. And we'll let it sit and think for a minute and it'll let me know if there was a problem doing that. Now, back over here to the OS patches, we can see what failed. It will let me know and call this an unhealthy system if they failed. I can see which ones are installed. It gives me links to the knowledge base so I can look at any individual one and go, what was this for? Oh yeah, this was a November 9th cumulative update for .NET Framework. You can insert by like the most recently installed ones from 115 cumulative .NET Framework up to date. And patching is a huge thing. This is what keeps people secure. It's critical that we keep these patches up to date. And sometimes you may want to be able to search things and you can look for different ones, filter for them. Now you can also do this on the company-wide scale to see how many of the systems have it installed, but we've narrowed down to a certain system we wanna look, but that's how that works on here. Tools, task manager, without logging into the system, I can have it query the system and tell me what's going on in task manager. What's the current CPU usage? I have this Ninja RMM MS Edge. Oh, why is MS Edge on here, man? It's doing something in the background. Is it taking up too much? Do we want to kill it? That's where you can take and like end a process, end a process, change, change priority, maybe kill something that's running in the background that you didn't want. So you can go through here and kind of get an idea of what's going on. Windows services. Did that service start? Is the service running? We can go through here, start, stop, change startup type. Maybe something was set to manual. You would say, you know, I'd like that actually to change the startup type to be auto, auto delayed. So it's the same features you have by going into the system. File Explorer. This is just convenient when you want to get to a specific user's documents. So we'll go here and say, all right, I need to go to get, find something in the user's default cookies and remove it. Or we'll go back over here to users, user, then we'll look at the e files. Let's go to the uh, documents and screen connect. What do we got in here? Some files in the toolbox. Nope, nothing in toolbox. Let's just go to files. Oh, there's some interesting ones. There's a set of one agent. Let's go ahead and uh, delete those. All right, so we per you know, I don't really need even this. Let's just delete this file too. Go ahead and purge those. Now I went through and deleted some files out of here that didn't need to be there. But what if I wanted to put something else there? Well, that's the option too. If I needed to upload a file, I could click upload and push a file to a particular system and as needed basis. We'll cover the backup in a second because I did some of these actions because once again, we need to be able to see the activities of everything that occurred. So deleted successful LTS demo user deleted these particular files. Before that, we deleted these particular files. Once again, all this is all part of a logged history of everything that happened. Uh, here is that completed, action completed, uninstalled program. Here's the results. Uninstalled program results success, output uninstalled complete, zoom. Great, now we know that this was uninstalled and it was absolutely completed. These are important things to know if whether or not there was success in here. And once again, we have that. What if we needed to know for different dates? Yes, we can filter that. Yes, we can filter for a particular user, particular accounts that did this, the type of thing that happened. We can even do things like, let's just look at different hardware changes that happen or 
different software changes that happen in a device. So they give you some granular drill down utilities to these activities. Now, I haven't really explored much the custom fields. This allows you to pull custom information out of the system and then create action and events out of there. Out of scope to really dive into it, but it's a cool feature that does exist on this system. Now back over to the script library, policies, and reboot, software update, Windows update, and maintenance. The script library is really nice because you can have your own custom scripts that you've added. You can also find a bunch of scripts that are just pre defined in here, such as do you want to defrag all volumes of boot volume, excluding boot volume, excluding boot and recovery volumes, and just hit apply and kick off a script. I'm doing it on an individual basis, but they can also be applied on a group basis, on a location basis, or on a company basis. This is what allows us to roll out software. We'll write a specific type of PowerShell script like we did here. We needed to delete a download folder. So this is one of our scripts. The ones that are native are just some of the native scripts built in. And of course, from there, you can do things like there's a defrag script. I think there's actually a floppy script. Disable floppy drive, native. Would you like to run this script? Sure, let's go ahead and get rid of the floppy drive on there. I think there's one for CD-ROM too. Disable CD-ROM. Are you sure you wanna run this? Yep, all right. If we go back over to our activities. Action, disabled CD-ROM. Disabled CD-ROM drives by LTS demo. Once again, having the whole history right here makes it very helpful to dive into what happened and how do we get to the spot where we're at with this particular system. Now, the next thing is the command DXE is root, uh, or I should say system root's not the right word for Windows, our command DXE is logged in user. Most of the time we're doing things in PowerShell, uh, gives us a lot of flexibility and whether or not you want to run it as user or you want to as, run it as system, you know, it depends on a different scenario, but I like that they have both in here. Either way, when you click on one of these, it will prompt you for your authenticator app of choice. They do support YubiKey as well, so you could either touch your YubiKey or in this case, I'm using TOTP with this particular user and now it's allowed me in here. This is all logged as well, but this would allow me on backend, non-interactive with the user. So the user's doing whatever they're doing and I'm deploying or removing or making changes to their system to solve whatever problem needs to be solved and hopefully without disrupting the user. We as technicians want to disrupt the users or actually some in sometimes not interact with them because that's time consuming and just fixing the problem is always the goal. Being able to just go on the backend, fix the problem the user was having and close a ticket way uh, better than having to sit and talk on a phone with someone or explain to them, hey, hold on, I need to take over your mouse. But in case you do have to take over their mouse, Ninja supports Splash Shop. You can purchase that through Ninja, which we have, but we also, because we do so much one-off and consulting work, have ConnectWise Control, and you can integrate both simultaneously in here. I believe you can integrate TeamViewer as well, but we don't use TeamViewer. The ConnectWise Control looks for your instance ID and then allows you to link it to exactly your session. So when we click this, it actually launches right here to join our session and we have these lab servers in this particular setup under our builds i'm running this inside of linux uh splash app is supposed to work in linux but i didn't get it working i didn't play a lot with it but enough that mm, didn't seem to really uh get it working the way i'd hoped All right and now that launched me right into interactive control so i'm seeing the same thing the client would be seeing and this is obviously really convenient you find a computer see the history can't solve the problem without getting interactive with the user, or maybe they need to show you the problem. Having that one-click launch makes it really easy. The integration is nice that they do uh, with both, as I said, ConnectWise and Splashtop. Back over to the activities log, which of course is really important as well. And you can see the history right here that LTS demo attempted a ConnectWise connection. Now, because the ConnectWise connection is outside of Ninja's control, they don't have any logging as to if you were successfully connected, but they can tell you that LTS demo did do that connection. From there, we do full logging inside of our ConnectWise control instance. So we have a history of the actual connection and the details thereof. So FYI on that for those wondering, um, and it will do the same if you're using something like Splash Top, it will also log that in the same way. All right, now let's talk about backups. We're gonna go over to LTS Demo Office, backups, overview. This is an overview of the LTS Demo Office and any systems that are on the backup plan within that Demo Office. So we can see which ones devices have it enabled, 
disabled, deleted devices, how much storage each of those devices is using and how much storage this particular customer is using. Now, one thing of note is the way that the file folder versus image backups, and let's go over to history. You actually have two different types of backups running here. And the reason for this is the file backups and the image backups are incremental. So it's not sending the entire image every time it runs. It's not sending every file. It's only looking at the differential changes. But the reason there's two of them is if I wanted to pull a file out, I can't pull a file out of the image backup. I can pull a file out of the file backup. So if we wanted to show which ones are running and actually let's go over our test win system backup and run a backup plan. Let's go ahead and run the file backup real quick. This is nice if you wanted to keep a file backup running even more frequently than nightly because obviously the image backups take a little bit longer because you're looking at the whole image of the system and you're narrowing the scope when you do the file backup. This will lead though, of course, because those files are also within the image. But the advantage of the file backup, if I have to restore an individual file, it's the fastest way to do it. So we've kicked off this backup process and let's go over here and manage the backups. So we click on manage backup. There's the image backups and I have done full testing of the way these work so I can go through and restore a full bare metal image that worked perfectly fine. Then we can go to the default file backup. And this is nice because this is where we can go through and look and push files back because users are how users are. So here's some files on this particular system and we're going to head and delete them because people do that and they go, oh, I actually wanted those files that I just deleted. So while we're back here, let's go to users, user, and those were out of the document folder. And there they are from the backup that we ran. Let's go ahead and hit restore. Where do we want to restore them to? Or what version of these files? Here's all the different dates since we kicked off the backup running on this system. So if there's a prior version, this is where we have the 1046 AM when I just ran. It ran the other at 7 PM, 1152, so on and so forth, depending on the schedules that I had set up for this particular system. So we know what versions are there. Restore to test wins. And you can drill down and put them back to the same place or sometimes as needed when someone has overwrote because they have more data in one file and the confusion that users sometimes create for this, I can restore them somewhere else where they still have that existing file. So maybe they need some data out of it and we can push another copy to their desktop. So we can go over here to users, go to the particular user and we'll just go ahead and put it back in the documents folder because we deleted them out of there and hit restore and it'll restore those, prepare the restore job and restore those back. Of note, and something you may have noticed in there when we go to restore, if we needed to, we can choose the other systems that are also having backup plans. Now this win 10 systems offline, so it doesn't let me restore it to it, but this may be something necessary where you have to pull a backup because one computer for whatever reason, it was destroyed catastrophically and they already have another computer they're working on and they need something done right now before you can get it replaced. You can take the backups and then push them to another computer within that company as needed. Of course, the other option is just being able to download these files to send them back to the user. So if I wanted to just grab or download this particular file, what version again, it'll ask, it only has one version right now, hit download for that file and then copy it, email it, however you need to get it back over to the user. And if we go back over, those files are automatically restored. And by the way, this took no interaction from the user. So deleting these files, restoring these files done from the back end, you didn't have to even get on the user's machine. I'm only on the user's machine to show you that they reappeared as magically as the users will sometimes disappear the files. Now this video did not cover absolutely every feature of Ninja One RMM tool. This covered the features that I thought were the most important, but of course there's always some other feature maybe someone else finds important. And I suggest you contacting the sales rep and reading through their site. Also, these are the features and how it looks in January of 2022 that I covered. And there's probably a future date where there's more features or some changes to the way the UI looks. And maybe I'll do an updated video. I will try to engage with all the comments down below, but please note YouTube does not make that always as easy to answer questions. And yes, YouTube randomly deletes comments that it thinks are spam, which is why there'll be an associated forum link where I have my forums that I maintain. So if you wanna have a more in-depth debate argument or just talk about what you do or don't like about the product, hey, that's a good place to have that discussion. And of course, there's plenty of other places Places you can do more reading on this, like Reddit RMSP, and there's plenty of people with opinions on different RMM tools for discussion. I'll leave a link to that spreadsheet that I had in the beginning of the video down below. And 
Thanks everyone for watching this video. And as I said, head to the forum for that more engaging discussion. That's better than the way the YouTube comment system works. All right, thanks. And thank you for making it all the way to the end of this video. If you've enjoyed the content, please give us a thumbs up. If you would like to see more content from this channel, hit the subscribe button and the bell icon. If you'd like to hire a short project, head over to lawrencesystems.com and click the Hire Us button right at the top. To help this channel out in other ways, there's a join button here for YouTube and a Patreon page where your support is greatly appreciated. For deals, discounts, and offers, check out our affiliate links in the description of all of our videos, including a link to our shirt store where we have a wide variety of shirts that we sell and designs come out, well, randomly, so check back frequently. And finally, our forums. Forums.lawrencesystems.com is where you can have a more in-depth discussion about this video and other tech topics covered on this channel. Thanks again for watching and look forward to hearing from you.